Hello, I'm Michelle Kremel, and in this lesson we're going to look at accumulated change and the average value formula. In our first example, we have a function r of t that represents the amount of water draining from a swimming pool. So the amount of water is measured in cubic feet, and the time t is measured in hours. So r of t is the amount of water. Then r prime of t represents the rate at which that amount of water is changing. r prime of t is our rate of change function. It's the rate at which the amount of water is changing. When we take the derivative of an amount, we get a rate. What are the units for r of t and r prime of t? Well, we already said the units for r of t are cubic feet. So this is feet cubed. And then the rate of change in the amount of water would be measured in cubic feet per hour. r prime of t measured in cubic feet per hour. So if we take the derivative, of an amount of change, we're going to get a rate of change. And that means if we take the antiderivative of the rate of change, we should get the amount of change. And so if we integrate r prime of d t, and so if we integrate r prime of t dt, we should be getting r of t plus our constant of integration. So let's think about this problem some more. If we set up a definite integral, so the integral from a to b of r prime of t dt, we know from the fundamental theorem of calculus that that's going to equal the antiderivative of this rate, which is just r, evaluated at the upper limit of integration, minus the antiderivative function evaluated at that lower limit of integration. So the integral of r prime of t dt from a to b is going to give us r of b minus r of a. And remember, r of b represents the amount of water draining from the pool at time t equals b. And r of a is the amount of water draining from the pool at time t equals a. So subtracting is going to give us the difference in the amount of water draining from the pool on this time interval. In other words, it tells us the amount of water that has drained during this time interval. So it represents the amount of water, and that's measured in cubic feet, that has drained from the pool between time t equals a hours and t equals b hours. In general, that brings us to the net change theorem. If f is a differentiable function on a closed interval from a to b, then the integral of f prime of x dx from a to b is equal to f of b minus f of a, and this is going to represent the net amount of change of the function f, the antiderivative of whatever function we have in our integrand here. It's the net amount of change in that antiderivative function on the interval from a to b. When you integrate a rate of change, you get a net amount of change. Let's look at this example. We have a table showing us velocities at given values of time t. In number one, we're asked to approximate the value of the integral of v of t dt on the interval from zero to 30. So as soon as I see that word approximate, that stands out to me. If you see approximate or estimate in a problem, you know that we're probably not able to find the exact answer, and that's why it's asking us to approximate. But we uh, know that our answer is just going to be an approximation, and we are going to use the approximation symbol instead of the equal sign to evaluate this expression right here. So we want to approximate the value of the definite integral using a midpoint Riemann sum with three equal subintervals. So my subintervals are going to go from 0 to 10, from 10 to 20, and from 20 to 30. I like to first determine the widths of each of my subintervals, and in this particular problem, the width is 10 for each of the subintervals. They're not always equal width, but it's nice when it works out that way. So we've got the width of each subinterval is 10. Now the height of the rectangle in each subinterval is determined by the midpoint value of the function. We're doing a midpoint Riemann sum. So you go to the midpoint of the interval, the subinterval. So the midpoint from 0 to 10 would be 5, and we look at the function value at that point. The function um, v is equal to 1.6 when t equals 5, so that's going to be the height of that first rectangle. The next subinterval goes from 10 to 20, and the midpoint value of that velocity function is 3.1, and then the last subinterval 
goes from 10 to 30. So the midpoint value occurs at t equals 25, and that midpoint value is 1.6. So our Riemann sum is going to be 10 times 1.6 plus 10 times 3.1 plus 10 times 1.6. So it's easy enough to multiply by 10, but we can also, if we notice that each one of these terms is being multiplied by 10, we can factor out the 10. So 10 times 1.6 plus 1 point, oh, 3.1 plus 1.6. And so that is going to be 3.2. And 3.1 is 6.3 times 10 equals 63. So that is going to be our approximation. This definite integral right here is approximately equal to 63. Now using correct units of measure, explain what this value represents. So remember, a definite integral is going to give us the net amount of change in the antiderivative function. And the antiderivative of the velocity function is going to represent the position function. So we're getting the net amount of change in position. And what's another way to describe the amount of change in position? Well, we can say displacement. So we're estimating that the displacement on this time interval is about 63 feet. We can also call this net distance if we uh, take the absolute value of it. It's already a positive number. So we can say the net distance traveled on the interval from t equals 0 to t equals 30 is approximately equal to 63 feet. The next question, what is the value of the definite integral of a of t dt from 5 to 25? And then using correct units, explain what this value represents. So notice in this problem, it doesn't ask us to approximate the value of that definite integral or to estimate the value of that definite integral. It seems to be implying here that we can find the exact value, and we can using the fundamental theorem of calculus. We know that to evaluate this definite integral, we just take the antiderivative function of a of t, which is going to be the velocity function, Assuming, of course, that the velocity function uh, here is differentiable. It doesn't say that in the problem. We're making that assumption here. So this is going to equal v of 25 minus v of 5. And we can read these values from the table. We know the exact value of v of 25. It's 1.6. And we know the exact value of v of 5. That is 1.6. And so we get 0. What does that zero mean? Well, it's the, remember, net amount of change. So it doesn't mean there's no change at all, but this is the net amount of change in the velocity over this particular time interval. So the net change in velocity on the interval from time t equals 5 to t equals 25 is zero, and then we want to get the units right for velocity. That would be feet per minute. For our next example, we have the temperature of water in a tub at time t. And it's being modeled by a strictly increasing twice differentiable function. So that gives us some information that we otherwise wouldn't know because of the fact that it's a table problem. Uh, we have the temperature of the water strictly increasing. And remember, an increasing function has a positive derivative. So that might be helpful for us to know. It's twice differentiable, meaning that the derivative of um, our function w of t exists for all values of t, and the second derivative also exists here for all values of t. That might be helpful for us as well. The first question is asking us to estimate the value of w prime of 12. So again, you want to key in on that word estimate or approximate. Here it seems to indicate that we're not going to be able to find the exact value of double prime of 12, and we're not. We don't have enough information to find the exact value, but we can approximate it using one of our methods that we've learned. So for w prime of t, we are going to use a central difference to approximate. The w prime of t is the instantaneous rate of change at time t equals 12. We're going to use the average rate of change on a close surrounding interval to approximate this instantaneous rate of change. So it's not going to give us the exact value of w prime of 12, but it will be a close enough estimate. So we pick the two closest surrounding points to t equals 12 which would be the 9 and the 15, and we're going to calculate the average rate of change on that interval. So w prime of 12 is approximately equal to 67.9 minus 61.8 
over 15 minus 9, which is 1.017 if we round to three decimal places. And let's think about the units there. So the function w of t is measured in degrees Fahrenheit, and we are finding the rate of change of w of t with respect to minutes t. So it's going to be degrees Fahrenheit per minute. Explain what the value represents. Well, again, this is representing an instantaneous rate of change. Even though we, we actually calculated the average rate of change, we're using that to estimate the instantaneous rate of change. So we can say that at time t equals 12 minutes, the temperature of water in the tub is increasing by about 1.017 degrees Fahrenheit per minute. Number two, use the table to evaluate the integral of w prime of t dt on the interval from 0 to 20. So here we have evaluate as our command term. We're going to be able to find the exact value of this definite integral, and we're going to use the fundamental theorem of calculus to do that. So this is going to equal this integral of w prime of t dt is going to equal the antiderivative function w at the upper limit of integration, so w of 20 minus w of 0. And we can read those values from the table. w of 20 is 71.0 minus w of 0 is 55.0, which gives us 16. Now we are integrating w prime, which has units of degrees Fahrenheit per minute. This is giving us the net change in w, in w only. So the units are just whatever the units are for w, so 16 degrees Fahrenheit. That is our estimate, no, nope, not estimate, that is our exact value of this definite integral, 16 degrees Fahrenheit. Now what does that value mean? So a common mistake that people might make is to say it represents the temperature of the water. It's not the temperature of the water. That would be pretty cold water. It's the change in the temperature over this time interval. So from time t equals 0 minutes to time t equals 20 minutes, the temperature has changed by 16 degrees Fahrenheit. And because this is a positive change, it means increased. The temperature has increased 16 degrees over this time interval. Okay, number three. For the time interval from 20 to 25, the function w has a first derivative given by w prime of t equals 0.4 times the square root of t times the cosine of 0.06t. Based on this model, what is the temperature of the water at time t equals 25? So notice our table only goes up to time t equals 20. We don't have information about time t equals 25 in the table, but we do have this function for the rate of change of the temperature of the water between time 20 and 25. So what we're going to do is use a definite integral to help us figure out the change in the temperature between times 20 and 25, because we already know the temperature at time 20. It's right here. At time 20, the temperature of the water is 71 degrees, so now we know the temperature at time 20, if we know how much it changed between time 20 and 25, we'd be able to figure out the temperature at time t equals 25. So we are going to set this up as 71, because that's the starting value that we know, plus, and then we're going to integrate from that time when it was 71, so 20, to 25, of our rate of change function w prime of t dt. And this is going to give us the temperature at time t equals 25. So this is going to give us w of 25. Now let's use the uh, numerical integration feature of our graphing calculator to compute the value of this definite integral. And we get 74.043 degrees Fahrenheit. In our next example, we have a pan of biscuits being removed from an oven. The temperature of the biscuits is 100 degrees Celsius when it is removed from the oven. So we'll consider that time t equals 0. The rate at which the temperature of the biscuits is changing is modeled by the function b prime of t. 
where t is measured in minutes. Find the value of b prime of 3, and then using correct units, explain what this value represents. We have the equation for b prime of t, so if we want b prime of 3, we simply substitute 3 into this equation here. So b prime of 3 is going to equal negative 13.84 e to the negative 0 0.173 times 3, which is negative 8.236. Now what are the units on b prime of t? So I like to think in terms of Leibniz notation when I'm trying to figure out units. b prime of t is the derivative of b with respect to time t. And b is being measured in degrees Celsius and t is being measured in minutes. So this would be degrees Celsius per minute for that rate of change. What does this value represent? It is an instantaneous rate of change. So we want to make that clear. We have to indicate somehow that it is an instantaneous rate of change, not an average rate of change. So we're going to say something like, at time t equals 3 minutes, the temperature of the biscuits is decreasing at a rate of 8.236 degrees Celsius per minute. And then at time t equals 10, what is the temperature of the biscuits? So we have an equation for the rate of change of the temperature. And if we want to know the temperature of the biscuits at time t equals 10, we can set up a definite integral to help us. If we integrate b prime of t dt on some interval, let's just say for, from a to b right now, we know that's going to equal b of b minus b of a. Well, we want to know b of 10. So we're either going to let a or b equal 10, because that's what we're trying to solve for. And we also happen to know the temperature at time 0. So we'll let one of these values equal 0, and the other one equal 10. Let's get rid of that there. So we'll set up our inter integral to go from 0 to 10, a time when we know the temperature and a time where we want the temperature. That's how we're going to determine that interval. And now I can say this is just b of 10 minus b of 0. We know b of 0. And we can find this integral right here using our graphing calculator. So that is negative 65.817 equals b of 10 minus, and then b of 0 is 100. We'll add 100 to both sides and get b of 10 equal to 34.183 degrees Celsius. For our next example, the rate at which people enter an auditorium for a concert is modeled by the function r of t people per hour. Now this one's a little bit tricky because right away it's telling us that the equation they're about to give us is a rate. And if you look at the notation here, it doesn't look like a rate. There's no prime symbol there, but it is a rate. So we just want to be uh, careful about that. R of t is already a rate, so already think of it as a derivative. So the rate at which people are entering an auditorium is given by this equation R of t. That is measured in people per hour. So t is being measured in hours, and we're working on the interval from 0 to 2 hours. VIP tickets were sold to 100 people who are already in the auditorium when the doors open at t equals 0. So that gives us an initial value. The doors close and the concert begins at t equals 2 hours. If all of the VIP ticket holders stayed for the start of the concert, so that's referring to these 100 people right here, if those 100 people stayed for the start of the concert, so at time t equals 2, they were still there, how many people are in the auditorium when the concert begins? So what we have to figure out now is what is the amount of people who have entered between time 0 and time 2? We have the rate of change equation, so if we use a definite integral from 0 to 2, we can get the amount of change in the number of people, in other words, the number of people who have entered. So we're going to set up a definite integral for this one to go from 0 to 2. And we're integrating our rate. 
So I'm just going to write r of t, just so that I don't have to write out the equation. But you could also just write out that equation. But this is already a rate, again, even though it's just called r of t. And this is going to give us the net amount of change in the people who enter the auditorium during these two hours. Plus, we want to add in the 100 people who were already there at the start. And that is going to give us the amount of people who are there at time t equals 2 hours. So we can calculate this definite integral using our graphing calculator, Math 9, to get 100 plus 980 for a total of 1080 or 1080 people. Now let's talk about average value. The fundamental theorem of calculus tells us that we can evaluate a definite integral in the following way. The integral of f prime of t dt from a to b is equal to f of b minus f of a. And recall we had a formula for finding average velocity, which is the change in position over the change in time. So p of b minus p of a over b minus a. It's also the um, just the regular rate of change formula for the function p of t in this case. So we can express average velocity as p of b minus p of a over b minus a, and we can make a substitution here. If we think of the function f as the position function, p of b minus p of a, I'm just saying that f is the position function p, then f prime, what is the derivative of your position function? Well, it's your velocity function. So if we integrate the velocity function on the interval from a to b, that's going to give us the net change in position, p of b minus p of a. So we can make a substitution right here. And um, I wrote v of t up here, but that's going to be the same as p prime of t dt. And then here we're switching that notation to call it v of t for velocity. Dividing by b minus a is the same as multiplying by 1 over b minus a. Okay, So now we have a new formula that we can use to calculate average velocity. Here's one way we can calculate it if we have the position function, then we can use that to find p of b minus p of a over b minus a, but that is also going to be equal to this expression right here, 1 over b minus a times the definite integral of v of t dt from a to b. So if we have the velocity equation, we might prefer to use this formula here on the right instead. Likewise, we can now express our formula for average acceleration in terms of a definite integral. We know average acceleration is the change in velocity over the change in time. This is how we expressed average velocity earlier. But v of b minus v of a, according to the fundamental theorem of calculus, can also be expressed as the definite integral of v prime of t dt from a to b. And that v prime of t equation is our acceleration equation. So we can say it's the integral of the acceleration function a of t dt uh, from a to b. And then dividing by b minus a, again, is the same as multiplying by 1 over b minus a. So we have this other version now of a formula for average acceleration. You can use either one of these formulas. They're both going to give you average acceleration on the interval from a to b. Now we talked about this in terms of motion, but we can generalize this to any um, function f of x. So we have what we call the average value formula here, and this is just generalized to a function f. The average value of a function f on an interval from a to b is defined to be 1 over b minus a times the integral of f of x dx from a to b. Now we do want to make sure that f is a continuous function. I probably should have included that as part of the definition here. So let's use our calculator to find the average value of this function right here. f of x equals x cubed times the square root of sine squared x. And so the setup for this, if we want the average value, is just going to be 1 over 3 minus 1, so 1 half, times the integral from 1 to 3 of f of x dx, and that is x cubed square root 
sine squared x dx, like so. So when we use Math 9, that's what we're going to enter on our calculator. And we should be getting 5.848. Now, without using your calculator, find the average value of f of x equals 2 minus 4x on the interval from 2 to 6. So we're going to integrate this one by hand. But the setup is going to be the same, 1 over b minus a, so 1 over 6 minus 2. And then we will integrate 2 minus 4x dx from 2 to 6. Okay, so the integral, I'm going to move up here where I have more space. The integral is going to equal 2x minus 2x squared. We don't need the plus c because it is a definite integral. We're going to evaluate from 2 to 6, and then we're multiplying by 1 over 6 minus 2, which is 1 fourth, like so. So that's going to give me 1 fourth, and then I'm going to sub in that upper limit of integration 6. 2 times 6 is 12, minus 2 times 36, minus, and then I'm going to sub in the lower limit of integration. 2 times 2 is 4, minus 2 times 4. which gives us 1 fourth times negative 56 or negative 14 for the average value of f of x on the interval from 2 to 6. In our next example, a ski resort uses a snow machine to add snow to the slopes at a rate of s of t cubic yards per hour. The rate at which snow melts is modeled by m of t cubic yards per hour. So we have snow being added to the slopes and we have s uh, snow melting, so in other words being removed from the slopes. At time t equals zero, the slope holds 50 cubic yards of snow. That's the initial amount of snow on the um, slope at time t equals zero. We're going to compute the total volume of snow added to the mountain. So that's not the amount of snow that's on the mountain, it's just how much is being added to the mountain over the first six hour period. So we want the amount of change of snow being added. We're gonna set up a definite integral. We just need to integrate s of t from t equals zero to t equals six. And using our calculator gives us 142.413. Now the rate that snow is being added is measured in cubic yards per hour. So the amount, the net amount of change, or the amount of snow that has been added on this interval would be measured in cubic yards. Now find the value of the integral of m of t dt from zero to six. So we can do that using the graphing calculator as well. And we get 81.823 cubic yards. Now the next definite integral looks similar, but it's got a 1 sixth in front of it. And notice that 1 over 6 in this case, and we're integrating from 0 to 6, is 1 over b minus a if we let a equal 0 and b equal 6. So this is actually representing the average value of m of t, the thing you're integrating. It's the average value of the function you're integrating on the interval over which you are integrating. So if we take our previous result, 81.823, and divide that by 6, we are going to get 
cubic yards, and that again is going to give us the average value of m of t. And m of t is a rate. It's the rate at which snow is melting. So it's going to give us the average rate at which the snow is melting over this time interval. Now, my units are not quite right then, because if it's an average rate, my units should support a rate. So it's cubic yards per hour. The m of t function has units of cubic yards per hour, so its average value should have those same units. And again, this is on an interval. It's the average value. So we want to say it represents the average rate at which snow is melting over the time interval from t equals 0 to t equals 6 hours. Is the volume of snow increasing or decreasing at time t equals 4? Well, we want to consider what is the rate at which it's being added at that time, and then what is the rate at which it's melting at that time. And depending on which is larger, we'll be able then to then answer that question. So S of 4, we want to compare S of 4, and we want to compare M of 4. So S of 4, 23.682 cubic yards per hour. And then we've got M of 4, which is 11.882 cubic yards per hour. So snow is being added at a faster rate than it is melting, and that means that the volume at that moment in time will be increasing. How much snow is on the slope? On the slope after five hours. So we have to consider how much has changed, how much snow has been added during that five hours, how much has melted during that five hours, and how much was there to begin with. We have to take all of that into account. So at time t equals 0, there was already 50 cubic yards there. Plus, to get the amount that was added during that time, we integrate our function s of t from 0 to 5. And then we want the amount that melted. So that would be the integral from 0 to 5 of m of t dt. And that's going to give us 95.335. How much snow? So cubic yards. Suppose the snow machine is turned off at time t equals 10. So between time t equals 0 and t equals 10, snow is being added by the machine. But at t equals 10, it's no longer going to be added. There still could be snow melting if there's still snow on the mountain at that time, um, but no more being added. Write but do not solve an equation that could be solved to find the time t equals k when the snow would all be melted. So let's first write an expression for the amount of snow that would be on the mountain at time t equals 10 when that machine gets turned off. So the amount of snow on the mountain at that time would be the initial amount, 50, plus, and then we're going to set up an integral to go from 0 to 10, which is going to give us the change in the amount of snow. Now we can do this in two separate integrals. I can say, well, it's the integral from 0 to 10 of s of t dt minus the integral from 0 to 10 of m of t dt. When you have two integrals like this and they have the same lower limit of integration and upper limit of integration, we can combine them into one. So I can simply condense this and say, it's s of t minus m of t. So that's optional. You can do that either way, dt. That's going to give us the overall amount of snow on the mountain at time t equals 10. So similar to what we did for number 4, but that was at time t equals 5. Now we're going all the way to time t equals 10. Now however much snow is on the mountain at this time still needs to melt. Right, so then we want to say, well, okay, we are going to need the amount <clears throat> at time 10 to the amount at time we don't know, so we'll call that k. No snow is being added, it's only melting. So whatever's left, on the left-hand side of the equal sign is the amount of snow on, left on the mountain. Whatever that amount is, 
That's how much we need to melt. No more is being added, but that's how much we need to melt. So we're going to integrate m of t dt to figure out the amount of melt from time 10 to k. And if these two things are equal, there will be no snow on the, amount, on the mountain. Because on the right, we're going to have um, the amount melted equal to the amount on the left, which is the amount on the mountain at time t equals 10. Okay, in our last example, we have a piecewise defined function f of x, and we're asked to find the average value of f on the interval of uh, from 0 to 5. So we do want to make sure that this is a continuous function, because if we have a discontinuity, or something wonky happening where the subdomains split right here, that is going to affect our ability to calculate the average value. So to determine if the function is continuous where the domain splits here, at x equals 3, we want to look at f of 3, and then we want to look at the limit of f as x approaches 3 from the left, and we want to look at the limit of f of x as x approaches 3 from the right, and we want to make sure that all three of these values are the same. If all three of these values are the same, then we know the function f is continuous at x equals 3. So to find f of 3, that's where x is exactly equal to 3, and we can see that that is in the first subinterval. So we're going to use the top function and evaluate that at x equals 3. We get the square root of 3 plus 1, which is 2. The limit of f as x approaches 3 from the left. So values of x that are less than 3 are going to be also in this top subinterval, and we will evaluate that limit in the same way using substitution. We get the square root of 3 plus 1 equals 2. So far, so good. And then the limit of f of x as x approaches 3 from the right. Numbers that are greater than 3 fall into this second subinterval. So we'll use the bottom function here and evaluate that limit using substitution. 5 minus 3 equals 2. These values are all the same, so we know our function is continuous. Now to find the average value, it's going to be 1 over b minus a integral f of x dx from a to b. But in order to e find the integral from a to b, we have to use two different functions. We have two pieces here. We've got the interval from 0 to 3, and we have this interval from 3 to 5. So we're going to have to split this up. The 1 minus b over a is going to be 1 minus 5 um, minus 0. But for the integral from a to b, we're going to split this now into two integrals. It's the integral, instead of going straight from 0 to 5, we have to go from 0 to 3 plus the integral from 3 to 5. And the reason we're splitting it is because the way we define f of x changes based on which subinterval sub -interval we're in. So this is going to be 1 over 5. And then we're going to integrate from 0 to 3 the square root of x plus 1 dx plus, and then integral from 3 to 5, 5 minus x dx. Okay. And we can use Math 9 on our calculator to evaluate the definite integrals, make sure we multiply by 1 fifth, and we end up with the result of 4 thirds. Okay, that's all for today's lesson. In the next lesson, we are going to look at the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Thanks for joining. Hope to see you next time.